Good morning, family. I feel like there's a lot of people in here today. It's kind of nice. A huh? um, little bit of housekeeping notes. Uh, Dave mentioned when he was up here about the website, uh, there is still a lot of work to be done. Uh, more functionality will be added to it as I continue working on that. And um, I am still adding member accounts. Uh, the people who are getting prioritized are the people who reach out to me. So if you want access to the site, the quickest way for you to get that is to let me know that you need a password so that I can so that I can focus on you, okay? Um, outside of that, uh, we're going to have one more lesson where we talk about gender roles in the church. Um, next not yeah next week uh we will be talking about the younger women and we'll be talking also about why it's important to separate out those gender roles why god assigns different responsibilities for different genders and different ages in the church so it'll be wrapping up that little segment i know it's been a while since we talked about um gender roles it's been a few weeks since we talked about the older women in the church, but this, today we're going to be talking about younger men. And uh, there's quite a bit to be said about the responsibilities of younger men, which I think lends to the idea that God expects um, men to fill a very important role in the church, uh, but also in the lives of their loved ones. So we're going to start with uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4. In verse 12, now this, this verse, this is, uh, if, you, if you're somebody who doesn't know, Timothy is written by Paul to Timothy, right, which is a, somebody he is trained to do ministry, and um, so most of this letter is an encouragement to somebody who's been called to a ministry, which leads us to a certain question, who is called to ministry? It's everyone. Every single person here is meant to minister to others. And my defense for that is that when we're called a royal priesthood, that, that title is not relegated to certain individuals in the church. When you are baptized, when you are saved, when you are washed clean by the blood of Christ, when you are added to the church, you inherit the title and position of royal priesthood and therefore the responsibilities of being a minister. So I think that a lot of the encouragement we're going to read in Timothy as well as other letters Paul writes with the same purpose like Titus really apply to everybody. Um, so verse 12 specifically talks about youth and I think that this is an important verse for young men to look at for a reason. It says, let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. Now, this is also repeated. Um, well, the idea is, is repeated throughout the Psalms, and we'll be looking at a couple of those too. But the point I want to make here is that this verse doesn't specifically talk about men. Um, and I'm, I'm convinced that these are things that even older people should do as well. But I bring it up for the young men, A, because it talks about Timothy's youth. And there is a lot of times, especially for younger men, you need to listen up to this. There is a lot of times older people will decide that you don't know what you're talking about because of your age. Or that you don't have a right to do something because of how old or young you are, how long or how short you've been in the church. But understand something. If there is somebody telling you that you are incapable of achieving a role because of how old you are, that is their mistake, not yours. There are older people that need to learn a thing or two about how church works and about how the kingdom of God works. And just because an older person tells you you can't do something does not mean you can't do it. Now, here's the other thing. And this is a, a fault I find primarily in younger people. 
Uh, and I'm, I notice I'm not defining younger people today because I expect you to decide for yourself if you think that you're young enough for this to apply to you. But <laughs> I know if one Sunday I decide not to offend people. Um, younger people have this flaw inherent within us that we want everyone around us to be right. In fact, one of the best pieces of advice I got from a fellow minister here very recently is, don't fall so head over heels in love with what the church is supposed to look like that you neglect to love the church as it is. And, and what I mean by that is so often we see that things aren't right around us or we find somebody not living up to our expectation or we, we notice the flaws and the failures inherent in our congregation and, and we blame them and then decide, well, I don't want to be a part of that because they're hypocrites or they're lazy or, you know, whatever, whatever inherent problem that you see in the congregation. I don't want to be a part of that. I'm going to go find a congregation where that's not the case. This, this verse really leads to the idea, though, that if you know what is right, you have a responsibility to provide correction through example. That means when I find a flaw in, in my congregation that I attend, when I find that there's something not happening that should be, or when I find that there are things happening that shouldn't be happening, it's my responsibility especially in my passions of youth, to provide an example for my congregation so that they can witness the correction firsthand. It's not something we often talk to each other about. It's not something we even often encourage enough in one another. But the idea of leaving a congregation or leaving the church or leaving a brotherhood or leaving even individual relationships because you find that they are not up to your standards of righteousness or holiness, because that is what he's talking about here when he says in speech and conduct and love and faith and purity, he's talking about living a righteous life, right? That's what those things are. It's not a good response. It is not a godly response to neglect those ties because you're not seeing these things present. The godly response is to be the one to exemplify that in the relationship. Is everyone following what I'm saying here? There, we, we, we live in a culture of, of a me first. I know that's been talked about pretty recently. And if you went to pray over Iowa, he talked a little bit on that issue as well about people coming to church for what they can get out of it. And to be fair, it's important to come to church. You should be spiritually filled when you come for service. You should be fed spiritually when you come here. That's the whole reason I spend time trying to put together a lesson. That's why somebody spends time making sure that they know how to lead the songs that they're putting up. That's why we take time to read the scriptures. Why we take That's why we do this. But... Feeding you spiritually, we're already focused on that. Those of us who are serving in the service. Which, which means if your focus in coming is just to be spiritually filled, you're not adding anything. Does that make sense? There, there is this mistaken crisis of mentality that I am somehow benefiting the church by showing up. The kingdom of God doesn't need you for it to exist. So that means that you're meant to do something while you're here. And if you're not, if you're just coming for what you can get out of it, you're a little more than somebody attending an all-you-can-eat buffet and eating by themselves. So what are you supposed to add? Well, that's, that's what is being addressed here. You're supposed to be providing an example. You're supposed to be providing, helping to provide a rich and holy and righteous environment for people to come and be spiritually filled in. But nobody can be spiritually filled on a lonely island. 
That can't happen. We're not meant to be alone. We're not designed for it. I hope that I don't have to quote the scripture for you to understand that there is scriptures that address that. But if you need some addresses, go to Genesis. It's pretty early on in the Bible where God says that this is not good. So he wants us to be together. But if you're not adding to the righteousness of the environment and the holiness of the relationship, what purpose are you serving? So an encouragement to the younger people. That if you see the things around you and they're not right, you have an obligation to be present to show them what is right. The correct response is never to leave and go find what is right. Because what is right should be coming from you. So, raises up a different question. How do you know what is right? Especially you younger people. Those that have not been around long enough to inherently have a sense of what I call right action. How do you know what is right? Well... 1 Peter chapter 5 addresses, uh, addresses exactly how that works, how you should know what to do at any given moment. And in 1 Peter chapter 5, the scriptures read, Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another, for God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. And is there anyone more proud than youth? Now, don't get me wrong. There's, there's plenty of older people that I could point to and say, oh, I've met a couple proud older people in my day. But youth have a special flavor of pride. Right? That you, older people, their pride comes from, I've, I've survived, you know, 70, 80 years, you know, so I know a thing or two about a thing or two. Younger people are just, I'm smarter than you, and therefore... I'm right. It, there is a certain sense of ignorant pride in the youth. Which is why it has to be tempered by accepting a role and a responsibility of submission. Now, most of you can remember having this thought, and if you can't, you probably having trouble remembering. But a huge flaw in young people is assuming that the old people don't understand that our world is somehow so much di more different than theirs was that their advice and their knowledge and their experience is no longer applicable. And to be fair, older people have the same problem. They look at younger people's lives and that's... You're, you're, you guys live in a wicked generation. We didn't do any of those things. And they make the flaw of thinking that because it wasn't present in their lives, that it must be evil or horrible or, or bad or that they can't apply themselves to your generation. So let's look at this. Um, Cyberbullying is, is a huge issue among younger people right now. How many of you guys are all aware of what, what that is, right? The idea of being a bully online. Now, to, to most older people, you get this idea of, well, if they're being a bully, you block them. Like, just don't have them on there. Right? But understand something. A, you know how to deal with bullies. Because either you had bullies when you were younger, or you were the bully when you were younger. So you still have advice on how to deal with them. And how often did ignoring a bully actually work? I can tell you it doesn't work because I was one. And ignoring me did not make me go away. So those of you who've dealt with bullies in your youth, you know how to deal with them. Your advice still applies. But it's important for you to recognize what the difference is. It's not that the bullying has changed. It's that they're no longer able to get away from it just by not being at school. Remember... You remember not too long ago, and I say that because when I was younger, we didn't, 
I remember when MySpace first started, okay? So I remember school before social media. And if somebody was mean to you at school, you at least got a break when you went home. And so while we can fault all of these young people for their online lives, the fact is bullying is so much harder to deal with because there's no getting away from it. It doesn't stop when you get on the school bus. They take it home with them. It's sometimes the last comments that they receive into their lives before they go to sleep. And sometimes it's the first ones they get when they wake up. Bullying is rampant in their lives in a way most of you guys didn't have to deal with when you were younger, unless you had a really horrible sibling. So it's important not to discredit the impact that that has on their lives. But it's also equally important to know that you have something to say about it. And that's valuable. There's so many things that feel different about people in different generations. But the fact is, read through Ecclesiastes. It makes it very clear. There's nothing that's changed. Not really. You know, we, we spend time talking about how the government is, you know, against us and we're facing persecution and, and you know, society is against us. Nothing's changed. Not really. That's why people came over to this country in the first place. It's why, why Christianity keeps spreading throughout every corner of the world. Why? Because people hate us. Nothing's changed. The bullies are still bullies. The victims are still victims. All the issues of society, still there. Now, they might increase or decrease as ages go by, or they might change the way it looks slightly, or the avenues people use to victimize others might look a little bit different, but nothing's really changed. See, much like God, society remains pretty consistent. Right? It is actually only a couple of absolutes that we can find in Scripture. And two of the biggest ones are God is good always and the world is evil always. So older people don't discredit your knowledge and your wisdom. It still applies today. And younger people, just because they don't know what Facebook looks like, doesn't mean they don't know what bullying looks like. Their advice still works. They've survived this long because they've learned a thing or two about a thing or two. Then just because you're young and presumptuous does not mean you're intelligent. On a personal note, I think it's important for young people to recognize the inherent flaws in the idea that mistakes are a part of youth. I've talked about this before, but there's, uh, there's a lot of euphemisms we use to excuse the foolishness of youth. Sorry, I had to make sure my mic was on. One of which, well, as always, even before I started reading Bi the Bible, has always bothered me is the idea of sowing wild oats. Now, this is really little more than an excuse parents will give to a young man who's going out and fornicating and have premarital sex. And they excuse it and make it not a big deal. Well, he's just sowing his wild oats, and then he'll settle down with a nice girl. The fact is, that's the kind of action that gets you to hell. There's no way around that. It doesn't matter how many bow ties you tie over the concept. It doesn't matter how nice you make it look or how nice you make it sound. Your son is living in sin. It doesn't matter what you call it. And unfortunately, young people are quick to accept those excuses. Because they're already looking to excuse themselves for whatever they want to do. And when mom and dad provides the excuse, that just adds a little bit more validity to it. We have to be careful. We have to be very, very careful 
to be the kind of people that will call what is evil, evil, and to call what is good, good, and to not make excuses and to not make exemptions just because we care about the person in question. Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 9. Rejoice, O young man, in your youth, and let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth. Walk in the ways of your heart inside of your eyes, but know that for all these things, God will bring you to judgment. Don't mistake what is being said here. I had to read this several times before I kind of figured it out. But because at the surface, it sounds like he's urging young men to follow their hearts, which doesn't sound right because we often tell people your hearts is what leads you astray, right? But look at this again. Rejoice, O young man, in your heart and let your heart cheer you. Sorry, in your youth and let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth. Walk in the ways of your heart and the sight of your eyes. But know that for all these things, God will bring you into judgment. What's this saying? You want to follow your heart? Go ahead, follow your heart. Accept and appreciate and celebrate your youth. <clears throat> appreciate it. it is, in fact, a gift from God, just like every other stage of life. But following your heart, celebrating your youth, must be tempered with the knowledge that God will judge you even when you're young. This is paralleled slightly in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 22 through 25. It says, So flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness. Faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart, have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth. So, which one do we follow? Are we to allow our hearts to cheer us, to follow the ways of our hearts, or are we supposed to flee youthful passions? Well, just like in the previous uh, verse that we looked at, it says God will bring you into judgment despite or because of these things. Your youthful passions are actually referring to the impulses of youth. That's, that's that when somebody wrongs you, I got to get back at them right now. And the uniquely young ability to follow through with that idea before ever actually figuring out what it's going to mean for you. We call that impulsiveness. I'm sure... Um, Rudy can tell you about some impulsive young people. I know I was, uh, when I was a kid, if I got insulted, I was fighting you, and I didn't even consider the fact that I was going to get into trouble until after some teacher had me by the ear pulling me down a hallway. The fact is, is as young people, it's extremely difficult to do. That's that, that's that passion that comes with youth. It's also strength if used correctly. So what Timothy is, is what the book of Timothy is telling us specifically in these verses is not to just not be passionate. You see, unfortunately, a lot of people, as we get older, we, we start to believe that we're supposed to put away all passions and we're supposed to be these hardcore stoics. There's, there's nothing for that. What does that really do for you? Passions is what makes the world move. It's what makes things change. Nothing in society has ever gotten better without somebody passionate changing it. 
But it's that impulsiveness. That ability to be passionate, absent of conscious thought. That ability to pursue passions and impulses without a skill that is so unused anymore, which is what we call critical thinking. So Timothy tells us to pursue righteousness, to pursue faith, to pursue love and peace. It tells us to avoid Ignorant controversies. Why? Because controversies bring discord. They are little more than a reason or an excuse to argue with others. And young people, most of the time, you are incapable of truly getting into an argument without saying something stupid. Why? Because you're too passionate. You're too impulsive. You don't think things through. Older people, they have a little bit of leniency here. Most of the time, you can sit there and disagree with something, and you have experience to help you back off when you need to. We take in uh, the one younger person who's turning red in the face because he knows a lot of this applies to him. You ever heard Brandon argue? That man will paint himself into a corner and then insist that he's walking into a doorway. That's not just a Brandon thing. That's everyone of that age. We love you, Brandon. <laughs> if I didn't like you, I wouldn't waste my breath on your name, bud. <laughs> That's everyone of that age. So young people especially need to be very careful about allowing themselves to fall into the controversies. What are the controversies? Well, I've talked about this before from up here. It's the things that don't matter, right? When I talk about keeping the main idea, the main idea, not majoring in the minors, those minor things, the things that don't matter, that you know don't matter, those are the ignorant controversies. The things that do absolutely nothing to build up the body. I'm not going to go into what those are. You guys know what they are. It's those disagreements that have absolutely no spiritual impact on anything ever. And somehow we find reasons to bring them up and argue about them. Now here's something else that lends to this concept of being passionate, but putting away youthful passions. So in... 1 Corinthians chapter 11, uh, it says, When I was a child, I thought like a child, I acted like a child, I reasoned like a child, but when I became a man, I gave up childish ways. Well, that's that youthful passions. So again, you don't put away the passion, you put away the childishness. There is... Little more glorious than an older man who still believes that this book has changed his life and that if, if people just heard about it, it would change theirs too. There is something powerful when an older man maintains his passion for the scriptures. When you see an, an older man who struggles through a prayer because of the emotions it elicits. When you see an older woman who cares so deeply for the people in the church that she will, make, she will work till her hands are dry and cracked. Making sure that letters are written and phone calls are made. Passion has a real place in our lives. And, and honestly, if you consider the gospel, it doesn't make sense to be stoic about it. Amen. It doesn't make sense at all. God tells you that you have died and been buried and joined in the resurrection and that you are going to live with him for eternity. What's there to be stoic about? What's there to be quiet about? What's there to be impassionate about? 
Do you realize how precious few people will ever get to say that they have gone through a resurrection from the dead? We're told that we're going to get a crown of life, that our name is going to be written in a book of life, that we are going to exist with the master creator for all of eternity. What is there to remain calm about? Get excited, get passionate, get out there and let people know what there is here. But you allow your defeat to ruin it. Every time somebody says no, every time somebody in their, in their ignorance or naivety decide that they don't see what they want to see and so they walk away and go somewhere else, every time we experience a loss of any kind, that turns into a defeat in our hearts and we allow it to dictate how we approach this whole thing. Has the message changed for you? Older men, think about this. You, you who were baptized 30, 40 years ago, has the message changed for you? Has what God done changed for you? So allow the young people their passion. Learn from it. If you have to adopt it for yourself once again. Your job is not to be impassionate, but to be wise and passionate. And I have to address that role because only then can I tell young people that there is an example for you to witness. That wisdom is there for you to tap into. If you're 40, there are 60 and 70 and 80 year olds here that have more wisdom than you do for you to be tapping into. If you're 15, 16, there is never ending amount of people older than you. It doesn't matter what age group you belong to. There's somebody that's learned a thing or two more than you have. You don't have to stop caring about these things. You don't have to stop being excited about these things. But don't be so excited and so impulsive that you make silly, ignorant mistakes. Like arguing over stupid things that don't need to be argued over. And I don't mean the playful arguing that we do just because we're friends and we can argue, right? Like you've seen that with Brandon and me. If it was a real argument, it wouldn't last as long as it would. Right? I'm talking about the things that are so serious to us that we are so enthralled by and so convicted of that it actually brings divisiveness to the church. But you guys can only handle one controversial preacher at a time. So if Rudy wants to talk about what those issues are, I'm going to let him do that. Thank you for being the bad guy today. <laughs> I got one last message for you today. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 13. Be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong. There's a lot of questions about what a man is, what a man should look like. This is where that wisdom is so important, older men, because younger men are having their definition of manhood attacked every day. You can blame them for being in a state of confusion, or you can offer them the things that life has taught you about what it means to look like a man. What does it mean to be watchful? It means even though I don't live in fear of what tomorrow holds, I'm not so stupid that I'm not looking to the consequences of my decisions and the consequences of my actions. Not only am I watching for Jesus' return, I'm watching 
for the real life consequences of the decisions around me. That means I pay attention to what's happening with my family and that I look forward to the struggles that might come ahead of us so that I can be prepared for them. Being watchful means that you're being observant. That means that you're making decisions based on the potential outcome of those decisions and not just being impulsive. Standing firm in the faith means that your faith does not rely on other people. That's an important thing for us to constantly remember. My faith has nothing to do with any of you. That's what it means to be stand fast. There is nothing you can do and nothing you can say to tear down my faith. It is present outside of any of you. And therefore, it will stand in spite of anyone. When your faith relies on other people, even the people closest to you, your faith becomes weak. And when your faith is weak, it is meaningless. You begin to see the importance of having passion. This is not a passive idea. These, these instructions, these responsibilities, there's nothing passive about it. Look at this. He doesn't say be a man. He says act like a man. The fact that you are a male has nothing to do with this verse. Act like a man. What does that mean? That means you are a provider. That means you're a protector. That means that you can walk into a room and see a need and you seek to fulfill that need because that is what a man does. Not because of who they are, but because of who you are. He also says, be strong. Now I'm convicted that in the Letter of Corinthians, we're talking about a spiritual strength, but I do uh, want to say there is an importance in physical strength, especially for men. Because what good is a protector who can't protect? Now, being strong is a subjective term as much as we hate that word, right? So nobody... Nobody's expecting Gilbert to be able to bench press as much as I can. Nobody's expecting Jay to be able to box Brandon and come out the victor, right? But if you look at yourself as weak, that's a problem. If you look at yourself as weak and you're okay doing nothing about it, that's a problem. Because at that point, you have admitted that you can't protect and you've been okay with it. It goes hand in hand. Mental strength, it matters. So how do we become mentally strong? That means that even if you don't like reading, you read. That means even if you don't like studying, you sit down and you study and you learn a thing or two about a thing or two because it's worth learning. That means even if you don't want to hang out with somebody, you look for the opportunity to learn what they can teach you. Mental strength matters. Without it, you can't provide. You can't leave. Being strong matters spiritually. How do you gain spiritual strength? By going to the one that provides it. Spend time in prayer. Spend time meditating on God's word. Spend time considering the things that are righteous and spend time on the spiritual disciplines. I'm not somebody that thinks that it's a command or that we have to practice things like fasting, but would it be so bad if men learned how to do those things again? Would it be so bad 
If men learned how to sacrifice the things in their lives in order to have more time dedicated to that which is spiritual, would it be so bad for your family to see you praying by yourself? Would it be so bad for you to tell people, I can't hang out with you, I've got studying to do? Would it be so bad for your best friend to hear you call them up and say, I just read this verse and these are my thoughts on it, what do you think? Would your life look so bad? I get it. It's not cool. Scholars are nerds and nobody wants to be one. I get it. Being disciplined doesn't get you friends most of the time. At least not the fun ones. I get it. Sometimes coming and enduring service feels just like that, like you're enduring. And sometimes barely just I get it. Sometimes the sermons can be a little bit boring. I get it. Sometimes the singing isn't on the level you wish it was. It's just not hitting right that day, or you don't know the songs, or maybe you're just next to the one person who, like me today, has some congestion in their sinuses and just can't sound quite right. Or maybe you're next to the person that just sounds horrible all the time. I get it. It's not always perfect. It's not always everything we wished it would be. But would it be so bad? Would it be so bad for this to be the goal of your life, to provide an example in your speech and conduct and the way that you love others and the way that you display your faith? Would it be so bad? To endure the boring things for the sake of what is righteous? Would it be so bad if your friends weren't that cool? If you did more than just hobbies? Would it be so bad if your life was just a little bit more quieter for the sake of caring about that which matters more? I consider the aspects of eternity constantly is something that kind of just exudes every thought process on every subject that I have. The idea of eternity, the idea of never ceasing to exist, the idea terrifies me, to be quite honest. It's, it's like, for those of you that care about things like math, it's like the idea of infinity. You know, and we, we, we say the word infinity and we use it and we understand that it means uh, without limit, right? But have you really thought about the concept of infinity? I mean, can you really wrap your head around the idea that something does not have an end? There's a reason why the, the people that study it do regularly... Uh, correct people and telling them infinity is not a number. Most people don't ever realize that. Infinity is not a number, it's an idea. It, it's actually numberless because number implies limitations. Just like infinity, can you really wrap your head around the idea that you will exist forever? In a place that never changes? You will exist forever. Doesn't matter what person you decide to be. Doesn't matter what your faith looks like. 
Doesn't matter what your discipline looks like. Doesn't matter if you believe in God at all. You will exist forever. So do you want to exist in the place that never changes, that's quite pleasant to be in? Or do you want to exist in the place that's nothing but pain and also doesn't change? That's the decision. But more importantly, when you start to contemplate this idea of forever, you have to ask yourself, how okay am I when people around me aren't going to the place that I know is better? That's the importance of sharing the gospel. It's not about they're wrong and I'm right and I need to tell them why I'm right. It's, it's about you're going to exist for an eternity and I really don't want to see you in the place where worms never die. It's you're going to exist for an eternity and the gnashing of teeth is not a kind of symphony you want to hear forever. It's you're going to live forever and darkness is a terrible, terrible thing to witness forever. It's you're going to live forever and that sounds awfully painful when that life is spent in a, in a liquid fire. That's why we share the gospel. That's why your stoicism has no place in your evangelism. Because how can you look at somebody knowing that they're going to spend forever in a place like that and just be okay? Proverbs chapter 20, verse 29 says, The glory of young men is their strength, but the splendor of old men is their gray hair. Your strength and your youth is something to be celebrated, but it's something to be used to. It's something to, to utilize for the sake of the kingdom. It's something to be utilized for the betterment of the people around you. It's not just something for you to enjoy. Just like an old man with all the wisdom in the world who does nothing but sit and enjoy the fact that he's wise serves no purpose in his wisdom. It's pointless. He's doing nothing but wasting that which God has given him. And understand when I say strength, I'm not just talking about physical strength. I'm talking about that passion that we have in our youth. That is strength. You have an opportunity and an obligation and a responsibility to utilize that for the sake of the kingdom. That means when you come to service, you don't sit back because I'm young and I can't do anything. You are the first in line because you should have the most passion out of anyone. Because you should be the first one forward for the task, knowing that there's going to be somebody there that can tell you how to do what you're supposed to be doing. It doesn't matter that you're young. There are people here who aren't. Enjoy your youth. Celebrate your youth and understand it won't last forever. But that should be used. But it's not meant for you to enjoy by yourself. On the subject of eternity, it's prudent to tell you how to make your decision. As I told you, there was a choice. It's one or the other. And it's forever. So how do you make your choice? Well, it was pretty easy. If, if you're interested in things like lakes of fire, which as many of you complain as, uh, at the coldness in here, maybe you need to think about that, but that's a joke, guys. It's, it's okay. Um, but if, if you're okay with the concept of lake of fire and darkness and gnashing of teeth and worms that never die, by all means, feel free to continue life as it is. You don't have to worry about a thing. It is literally the easiest choice you can make. You just don't do anything. 
But if you're interested in the crown, to have your name written in the book of life, to have God, God the creator, look upon you with pride and joy, if you're interested in the concept of spending a place where worship continues on forever, the choice is pretty easy. Meditate on the things of God, right? That's that hearing of God's word. Spend time studying it. Read it, listen to the lessons, talk to people about it. It means that when we see the things that lead to the lake of fire, we turn the other way. That is that fleeing from sin. Not walking, not crawling, not turning away. Fleeing sin. Why? Because what do you do when something threatens your life? If a bear comes out of the woods and is chasing after you, no one just calmly looks away from it. If you're on a train track and there's a train coming, nobody just calmly walks to the side of the tracks. What do you do when something threatens your life? Brandon, you're an idiot if that's the case. What do you do when something threatens your life? You flee from it, right? Because nobody wants to die. It's the same concept. That's the idea of repentance. It's not just, I'm going to look away from the sin. It's, this is threatening my very eternity, and I am going to run from it. Because it's that important. We have to remember that spiritual death is just as and more catastrophic than physical. It means washing ourselves of what remains from a life of sin. That as we flee from that spiritual death, we cast aside the evidence that it was ever a part of us. We do this through baptism, through that joining in Christ of His death, burial, and resurrection so that we can be a new creation. So that we can rediscover our original intended purpose. We accept that holy seal on our spirit that is the Holy Spirit. That evidence that we belong to something greater now. And lastly, we understand that as a new creation, as, as a creation that has rediscovered and been free to fulfill our original intended purpose, we live a life of love. And love does not exist without passion. This morning, if we can help you with any of these things, if you've been struggling and you'd like prayers, if you'd seek reconciliation with somebody who maybe uh, uh, you guys are dealing with some kind of ongoing issue or grudge and, and you'd like to be reconciled, or maybe you'd like to be reconciled to your brothers and sisters in Christ, whatever your needs are this morning, be they prayers or confession or baptism, we ask that you bring those needs forward and make them known so that we can help you see them met as we stand and sing.